Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at geologic time. So in this video we're going to be focusing on how we use fossils to infer the age of rocks and this is going to correspond to section 9.7 of your textbook. So on the slide you can see a diagram that consists of a stratigraphic column with five uh, distinct layers of rock in it and we can see there are also several different foss fossil species labels A through I. So the first thing we can see is that these fossil species are changing in a systematic way as they progress up through the stratigraphic column. So for each of the fossils, you can see there is a defined range. And this range obviously begins the first time the fossil is seen in the geologic record, and it finishes where the fossil is last seen in the geologic record. And what you'll notice is there is a systematic change as you progress up through the stratigraphic column. So as you're getting younger. So for instance, what you can see is we can quite clearly see here that A precedes B. We don't see A suddenly appearing here and then reappearing further up the stratigraphic column. We see A appears here, that's it, and then it's followed by B. So there is a systematic way in which fossils occur, and this uh, is reflected in real life as well. So in the real geologic record, we can see that fossils occur in a known order. And this is one of the things that helps us when it comes to dating rocks. Because we know the order for most fossils, we know where they fit in the sequence, and this allows us to use the fossils to date the rocks. So the next thing we notice is that some species have relatively small ranges. So if we look at fossil F here, you can see that it makes its first appearance here and its last appearance here. So its range is relatively small. Now, these are the perfect fossils if you want to date a layer of rock. So these fossils that have relatively small ranges are very often referred to as index fossils because these are the fossils you're actually going to try and use to date your rock. The reason is, is that because they have this relatively short range it means that they were only around for a short period of earth history so if you can find fossil f in your rock well that means your layer must have formed during this small window and so you can see how that's going to be helpful to geologists now compare that to a fossil that has a longer span something like g or e maybe we can see the ranges for both of these fossils are quite large so we can see they make their first appearance here and their last appearance here now the problem is, is that well, if we were to find fossil E, for instance, in our sequence of rocks, well, it's a bit difficult to work out exactly when that layer could have formed, because did the layer form down here towards the, the early stages of E appearing, or did the layer form here towards the end of the range of E, or did it form any time in between? So when we're dealing with fossils that have quite large, large ranges, they are nowhere near as helpful in terms of dating a layer of rock. Now, there is one more thing that we can do to actually help us date our layer of rock, and this is the use of overlapping ranges. So if we look at the diagram here, we can see that fossils G, fossils H, and fossils E all have an overlapping period of time when they all could have coexisted together. Now, this is quite helpful to us because if we look at fossils G, H and E, you will see they each have quite large ranges. So in terms of helping us date a layer of rock using them, they're not that great because as mentioned, what we really want are fossils that have very short ranges like F. Those are the best ones for dating. Now, what we can do, though, is we can use the portions where the ranges overlap to define a much smaller area. So clearly, there is going to be a very limited period in Earth history during which fossils G, H and E could have coexisted together. And it's this area right here. So if you can find a layer of rock that contains fossils E, H and G in it, well, then you know it must have formed sometime during this period here, and that means therefore that your layer must date to this window of time right there. So you can see that fossils are extremely helpful to geologists. Now, in terms of using fossils to actually 
put a numerical age on a rock, that's more difficult. Most of the time when you're using fossils, what you can say is, right, this layer of rock formed in, let's say, the early Devonian, or this layer of rock formed in the late, in the late Permian, something like that. That's normally the best you can do. You, you know, in, in most cases, you can't put a numerical value on your fossil. And the reason for that is, is obviously if you want to be able to work out where the lower boundary and upper boundary of your fossil are, you need a datable layer of rock. And the problem is, is that in most cases there isn't a datable layer of rock here and there isn't a datable layer of rock here. So you'd want something like a lava flow maybe. And you know, you just don't get that lucky. So most of the time you can use fossils to say, right, this rock formed in let's say the middle Silurian for instance. And that's about the best you can do. But typically, if you can find a fossil in your rock that has a relatively short range, that's going to be your best bet for getting a relatively accurate date. So if we look at this diagram here, what we can see is that we have two sections. So these are two different locations. And what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and correlate between these two different locations using the fossils. So the aim of correlation is to try and join together layers of rock which have the same age. Now to be clear, the layers of rock you're joining together do not have to be the same rock type. They just have to have the same age. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and correlate between these two different locations using the fossils. So if we look over here, we can see we have fossil A at the base of our sequence in this location, and there's fossil A over there. So we know that this layer and this layer must have formed at the same time, so we can join them together. Now, if we look at this layer here, we can quite clearly see that we have fossil F located here, and we have fossil F located here. We can therefore assume that these layers are also the same age. Now, fossil C, you'll notice, occurs at this location, but it does not occur, occur over here. Now, this would imply one of two things. It would imply either layer C is getting thinner, and is slowly disappearing and disappears before this location. Or maybe at this location, there was a layer of rock that contained fossil C, but it was eroded away. And that would mean that this contact here would be in unconformity. So as we continue up the sequence, we can see here's fossil G and we can see fossil G over here. So we can correlate between these units and say they're going to be approximately the same age. And once and here at the top, we have fossil I and there's fossil I over here. So we can correlate between those units and say they're the same age. Uh, just like C, fossil H here, you can see occurs at this location, but does not occur at this location. And once again, this could mean either the layer of rock that contains fossil H is getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and then eventually just disappearing and pinching out. Or maybe there was a layer of rock at this location that contained fossil H, but that layer of rock has been eroded away, so it's been lost. And that would, of course, mean that this contact here would represent an unconformity. So if we wanted to actually view uh, what we were talking about, this is how it would work. What we do when we do a correlation is we join together the top and bottom of the same layer. So for instance, in the case of la layer A, obviously we're not going to deal with the bottom, but we have the top of layer A here and the top of layer A here. So we're going to join a line, uh, draw a line, sorry, joining the two together right there. For this layer here containing fossil F, you can see right there's the bottom of the layer and here's the bottom of the layer containing fossil F. So we'll draw a line from there to there. And here's the top of the layer, we'll draw a line from there to there. Now by doing this, you'll notice we form a triangle here, which represents layer C. And so this triangle is showing us that layer C is slowly getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and then eventually disappearing from the rock record. So it doesn't appear at this location here. And the same thing happens with fossil H right here. So you can see how we are able to use fossils to essentially link together layers of rock from different locations, even if the layer of rock is, at, is different. So for instance, just going back to this layer that contains fossil I, at this location, this layer of rock could be a limestone, and at this layer, the layer of rock could be a mudstone. 
And so if you were joining them together based purely on the rocks, you wouldn't do that because you couldn't correlate them because they're different rock types. However, if you use the fossils, you will very quickly realize that this uh, rock here and this rock here are the same age, even though they consist of different rocks. And so you can use that to correlate them together to say, right, these rocks were being deposited at the same time. They were just being deposited in different environments. So maybe this one over here, the limestone represents a reef environment, and maybe this this layer uh, over here, I represents a delta or something like that, which was in the same area. So the final thing we can do using fossils is we can compare overlapping sections. So we were just discussing how we correlate between rock sequences at different locations. Now, the thing is, is in most cases, you will not get the same sequence of rocks at different locations. Very often your sequence will be part of a, uh, a previous location sequence. So we can see in this diagram here, we have a sequence of rocks from location one and we have a sequence of rocks from location two. And so what we want to do is we want to try and work out, right, where do these sequences of rocks correlate? Now, there's a few ways we can do it. We can look at the rocks themselves, but very often the easiest way to correlate these layers of rock is going to be using fossils. So, for instance, you can see here we have a grey limestone. Our aim would be to try and correlate these layers using the fossils in them, and hopefully we would find a fossil here, we would find a fossil here, which would tell us they formed at the same time. And so we would say, right, chances are these layers of rock are the same, well, all forming at the same time. We would also try the same thing for layer five and for layer six and hopefully what we would see is we would see the same progression of fossils in this three in these three layers of rock as we would see in these three layers of rock and that would be the definitive evidence that we would use to actually correlate these layers together so we'd say right even though the thicknesses of the layers are different using the fossils we can see that they formed at the same time so by using the fossils, we've managed to correlate together these three layers of rock from two different locations. Now, by doing this, what we've actually managed to do is we've managed to produce a larger stratigraphic column than we started with. So if we were just using the rocks from the first location or the rocks from the second location, we would have a more limited stratigraphic column. However, by being able to correlate between these three layers of rock, essentially what we've managed to do is we've managed to reconstruct a more complete section, starting with this layer down here at the bottom, going up to this conglomerate up here at the top. So you can see the power of being able to correlate between different locations. It allows you to produce a more complete uh, stratigraphic column for your area. And this is obviously going to be important because this can allow you to produce stratigraphic columns that will literally cover a very large portion of geologic time for areas of the Earth's surface. And that will allow you to work out the story of how that area evolved over time. So I think it's pretty clear that fossils are extremely helpful when it comes to dating layers of rock, and they are also extremely helpful when it comes to correlating rocks from different locations. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.